All right, before we get into this episode, I feel like I should clarify some things on how I'm tackling this series. So as I see it, this show is its own show. This is a brand new take on the story, so it's beholden to no rules or continuity or whatever from the previous version. It has to set up its own world and characters and rules and everything, and it will only be internally responsible for keeping those things in check. This is its own show, that's why when I talked about Ang flying, I discussed why I thought it was an inelegant way to introduce a viewer to airbending. I didn't say, oh, but he can't do this in the original, or, or oh, but Zaheer. This is its own show, it's its own thing. You obviously want to see some of the most beloved things adapted to live action, and the broad strokes stay the same, but it's starting all over. At the same time, since this is its own show, it has a lot of work to do. I feel like there are many times across this whole season where storytelling and character can be glossed over because the show might assume that you've already seen the cartoon. It can't take shortcuts in writing and world building and character on the assumption that these things are already well known. That should not be the aim of a remake, it has to be able to stand on its own. So when I see these moments arise, I'm gonna talk about them, yeah. Lastly, like I said in my series overview, this is Avatar The Last Air. Airbender. It's its own thing, but there's already an Avatar The Last Airbender. Yes, when the live action has something that I believe was executed better in the cartoon, I'm gonna talk about that, and vice versa if that ever arises. It's its own entity, but the two can be, and I think should be, compared. That's how I'm doing it. I'm not policing how you interact with media, you can think and do whatever the hell you want. And I'll probably end up being a hypocrite about stuff I just said by the end of the series. I'm human. But in general, that's the way I'm looking at this, through the lens of these YouTube videos. Alright, that's all. Start the actual video. Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, there it is. The ultimate warrior. He's a coward. I know none of you watch wrestling, but every time Zuko says the ultimate warrior thing, I can't help but imagine how good the show would have been with Aang's entire character being replaced by him. Like, this is what Zuko was expecting, right? This avatar is not what you nor anyone else would have expected. Let's talk about that for a second. What were you guys expecting? Because honestly, no one outside of the Airbenders knew who the Avatar even was 100 years ago. And like 15 seconds after they told Aang, Aang left to go to get himself frozen. And 15 seconds after that, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. So Grand Grand knowing Aang was the Avatar kind of makes even less sense than it already did. Like she already plucked it out of thin air, but Aang wasn't even known to the world back in his own day. I think it would have been very reasonable for everyone to assume that he was killed along with everybody else. There wouldn't have been any room for Grand Grand to be aware of some legend of the Avatar being a 12 year old boy airbender with his tattoos already who disappeared, the Fire Nation attacking one femtosecond after Aang leaves makes the script even weaker in that way as well. Zuko doesn't even really seem all that surprised that Aang is the Avatar. In the original one, you're not even really aware of how the Avatar cycle works yet outside of a vague line from the opening, and Zuko seems convinced that the Avatar is probably just a very old air nomad, and that information is important to get across so we know Zuko's expectations and why he's surprised later. We don't know Zuko's expectations in this one past him being the ultimate warrior. Is he expecting an airbender still? because they know somehow Sozin didn't get him? A waterbender should be equally, if not more likely, considering the circumstances and location. If you're really paying attention to this adaptation, shouldn't Zuko be floored here? Like, what the fuck, there is one, an airbender at all, and two, he's the Avatar? Didn't Great Grandpa smoke all those dudes since they were all in one place? And I will find him. I'm still the heir to the throne, that's gotta mean something. Oh, an addendum as well, I didn't say something very well last video, I said Cartoon Zuko only mentions his throne once, which isn't true, he mentions it three times. What I meant was that Zuko only mentions his throne in the same egotistical, entitled way that live action Zuko does once, and it's used to make him crash back into reality very quickly, which certainly gives a different vibe, it's my fault I didn't word that very well. How many places can there be for an avatar to hide? Who, me? Uh, I don't know. 15? I was looking at the circles on this map, and I don't think they really line up with anything. This one is obviously Bossing Se, and I think this one is around where Haru's village would be if he was in the show. But this one over here, no idea, and I'm pretty sure we never go to this area of the world at all in any Avatar TV-based media, so fucking beats me. According to this, Avatar Kiyoshi was the fiercest of warriors and a master of what they called the Avatar State. The book. The hellish book. What an addition. I don't know when I'm gonna get into why the notebook is such a whack device in the show, but I'll tell you for sure every time it shows up and I hate it. Before I met him, I couldn't bend enough water to fill a thimble. And now look what I can do. I mean, I gotta give it to you, it is impressive you can summon water one mile into the sky, but I don't really get the vibe of now look what I can do at all. You move water twice in vague blob format, I ain't trying to gatekeep, but it doesn't seem like Angus had that big of an impact on you yet. All you've really done is be sad at each other. <laughs> Holy shit, one of my favorite things about the live action is that Momo just makes stock chimpanzee noises. It's so funny. Everyone likes that, right? Everyone's like, yeah, good job. Except probably D. Bradley Baker. Oh, there he goes. You don't really see it, but is that flying too? If that counts, it's not only in the first episode, I guess. Don't get me wrong, Ang got hella vertical in the cartoon, but the difference is very apparent. But this could very easily just be a super jump. Though the waterbending scroll doesn't have any legendary techniques from the cartoon, it does seem to have some pretty cool references. This one up top does seem to have some stances that mirror the original water whip. This one over here seems to 
have a pose that is very similar to one Paku strikes when he's fighting Katara. Up top, we have a probable reference to Kaya and Korra with her unique style. And even down here, we get the octopus form, and it seems to have the movements that Aang does when we first see him use it. <laughs> I bet you taste like chicken. Whoa, what the fuck is your problem, bro? That came out of nowhere. Momo doesn't even run away or mess with him at all in this one. Saki's just like, hey, Momo. Fuck you. Why? This is what I mean. Like, it makes sense as a reference to the original cartoon because Sokka starts off wanting to eat Momo. Haha, -ha, I get it. But this line in the context of this show alone doesn't really read very well. What's it called? Quail Pole. Quail Pole. Quail Pole meaning quail tadpole? Does that not turn into a quail frog eventually? Or is this one of those real life things I don't know about, like lychee nuts, and I'm embarrassing myself again? This is a scene in the show. We use it mostly to characterize Zuko and Iroh more, which is good. We didn't get nearly enough of that in episode one. And it very much shows us Iroh isn't all that concerned with the task at hand, but at the same time is trying to teach Zuko. Zuko gets to be somewhat hot headed and a little short with Iroh. Uh, I think this scene's good, actually. I think the dialogue is shaky again, though. Iroh says Zuko will need to use tact and empathy when trying to get his way in this military order. Really? Empathy? I think the show will have enough empaths after a few episodes here. Anyone else find themselves wishing there was a little Loch Ness Monster-esque Unagi Easter egg here, even if it doesn't show up in the episode? Little Easter eggs like that hit harder for me than referencing a random line for the cartoon, but uh, it's just me. Hey! Oh, it's the start of a fight. I better do a giant backflip. You're making a mistake. He's the Avatar. Ridiculous. There would have been signs if he was the Avatar. Yeah? That's what you're going with? What signs? What signs are you talking about? Does it feel like to you guys this show can just throw out dialogue for no reason? No logic behind it? Did this Kyoshi statue not start glowing when Aang came out of the ice? Or when he went loco with the air temple? If that didn't happen, what signs, Suki? I'm at a loss to what you mean. I think that might be a sign. <sighs> just shoot a missile at her. Oh, you already did? Good, thanks. All I want is to learn more about Avatar Kyoshi. Isn't that what this place is about? Keeping our memory alive? Uh, no, I just live here, bro. Oh, Yaji sighting, my man? Look at him, the subtle side eye, the relaxed posture, the unresting, unyielding, undying need to be mayor. What harm is there in letting him look through some books? It's not about them. It's about who else may come, I know. What do you think they're whispering about? I don't know, this is kind of awkward. Yeah, there's like a hundred people in this room. It feels weird that they think they can get away with this extended aside, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're too young to know that there are many in this world who would take advantage. I'm not too young. I just haven't seen the world. Okay, so with that, Suki's whole motivation has been clunkily explained to us. Like, it would be different if it wasn't just a random whispering conversation with her mother where they explain her entire character, right? If these things could get across in future dialogue, naturally with Sokka, that would feel much better. They spend a lot of time together, and since Suki seems to be stricken with some sort of small island social ineptitude, she walks around like a fucking velociraptor, this information coming out to Sokka could soften her to him and make the fact that she's interested in him flow better, I feel. How are you protecting your people if you're here? What? I'm not. I mean, I am. Making Sokka not sexist here, I've already talked about, I think it's a negative, but when you really think about Sokka's character more, without the snark, the overly cynical attitude, and the feeling that he's already way better than he is, what does that leave us with for his character? He's awkward around girls, and often disagrees with his sister, in line with the cartoon still, sure, but not really a lot to bite onto there. Sokka seems precisely aware of how not sick he is, which means we never get the feeling of him being taken down a few pegs, and growing to like him as he rolls with it, and learns and grows to be a better person, and tries to be the man he thought he already was once. Having him start here, having his arc start in this place of insureness while also being put upon as the leader, drastically changes how the viewer takes his story. He's not this character that learns he's not who he wants to be and then works to be that person. He knows he's not who he wants to be already, which I think skips a crucial part in what makes Sokka's arc so great. That can resonate with a lot of people. Also, call me crazy since they're not doing the Sokka sexism thing. And stay with me here, I think they should have done a racism thing with Sokka. Now hear me out, and this isn't an easy thing to work in with how they did it. You'd have to change a lot, but listen. Sokka's been been fighting the Fire Nation in his mind his entire life. He'd naturally be predisposed to hate anyone from there. But then we have that moment in the OG show that feels kinda rushed, where Shayu, the Firebender, becomes their friend pretty quickly. We could use Sokka's very natural and understandable hate for the Fire Nation as a character beat. And then, in this new hypothetical episode where Shayu and Sokka meet, Shayu can prove to Sokka that not everyone from the Fire Nation is just inherently evil, right? That would be a pretty strong beat and a pretty timeless lesson. It can highlight Sokka's closed-mindedness still, and have him see that he doesn't know the world the way he thought he did. Exactly exactly the kind of moments Sokka's had removed from his story here. Eh? Right? Put that shit in season two. There's a free one, writers. Prince Zuko? <laughs> actual royalty to our humble base. What can I do for the crown prince? I fucking love this guy. Oh, triangle flag. Gotta love it. Fire's a triangle. Remember that? Excuse my nephew. 
We've been at sea a long time, and our manners have grown as rusty as our anchors. See what I mean with his Iroh dialogue? Paul's a great actor, but I don't think anyone could do much with a line like this, no matter how they played it. It's just like a cheesy line. Something that an alien that you described Uncle Iroh to would write. And I think the performative quality Iroh has to some of his lines is maybe Paul's way of having these weird cheesy lines feel more natural. If he said this in a normal speaking tone, it would be even more like, what the hell did you just say? If Joe Pesci said this shit, you'd be like, huh? So he plays it like this which makes sense, but I don't think there's any saving it, man. It all comes back to the writing. Well, we don't get many VIP visitors around here. VIP may not be an anachronistic term. I honestly don't know if it is, but I think the main thing is that it feels like it is, and it takes you out of the scene for a second. God, he's the best. Despite all the bitching I did and this silly as hell scene, I'm gonna say some good stuff about the Sakasuki stuff. Just you wait. Amazing! You're a natural. What? No, she's not. She sucked at it. Can I just say I kind of like what they did with the Yang tattoo? I think it's a very good middle ground. Still very much a blue arrow, but at the same time having some subtle, more intricate design to make it feel more at home in a real world setting. I think two thumbs up for that choice. You know, you should be practicing too. The Avatar needs to master all four elements. You know, it's hard for me to parse where I'm going to have these bigger talks about stuff like the Aang not waterbending thing. When covering the cartoons, I can sort of set myself up to make a stronger point videos in advance by talking about a thing in one episode and then talking about it again when it reemerges in another. But with this show, it feels like most of the problems with it are so blanketing and steady. I'm gonna have a hard time not just saying all I have to think about it as soon as they show up for the first time. I've written this entire paragraph basically to say I'll talk about the Aang not waterbending thing later, I think. Are you really an airbender? This kind of airbending telekinesis I don't mind. If it's close to Aang and he does some small movements, it makes sense. I think there's this lovely little natural understanding in this magic system in that bigger, more intricate moves will naturally make a bigger, more spectacular effect. Aang doing the very dexterous move of getting the keys last episode broke that, I feel, in a way that something like this doesn't, and in a way the cartoon knew it could feel natural with as well. I know that this is like the worst, most bad faith form of criticism, but I can't help but notice that the two times the show has had kids playing written in the screenplay, it has translated to kids just run around in circles and chase each other and laugh. Damn, they got him in the off-white Yeezys? This moment has rubbed people the wrong way, the Aang statue thing, and I can see why, when you put it up against the cartoon, you definitely lose all of the energy, the comedy, the juice, you know? And I try to reason, well, if Aang flew into the statue going 100 miles per hour like he does in the cartoon, the rest of the season would be about Aang's burial and funeral. You can't have Aang slam into this going Mach 3 because in this medium, it has to be more grounded, so Aang can't go really fast here, he would get really hurt. And if he didn't, it would be like, what the hell, why isn't he hurt? And while yes, that is the logical explanation to having it be this way, I don't think it makes it any better. Just don't have this moment if it doesn't work well. Simple as that. It's an adaptation. I want the fan service. I want to see recognizable things, but I also want to see them work. I like the Suki headdress design too. It looks just like the cartoon, but also adds the idea that the cross is two folded fans. Eh, a nice one. See? Fire. Triangle. Gather any reports of unusual sightings in the last few days. Anything out of the ordinary, no matter how small. And do it fast. All right, all right. I'm enforcing a rule from now on. I can only say how much I love Ken Leung and Zhao once per episode after this, no matter how awesome he is. This is a very odd moment, one of the few where the show loses that groundedness I talked about just a minute ago. The show seems to be confused as to what level of believability it wants to be at. Bending is one thing, there's a magic system, and you accept that, and you learn the limits as you go. But for the same reason they tried to make Aang's statue crash work, this does not. In this more grounded world, why can Suki do a special fan throw that curves and seems to ignore hitting obstacles? What level of realism are we at here? Not to harp on the Game of Thrones thing again too much, but it would be like if you watched the first five episodes of Game of Thrones and then suddenly someone knocked three arrows at once and hit a triple bullseye. It's just like, oh, what? It doesn't feel right. Us Southern Water Tribe Warriors are no more for our hand-to-hand -hand fighting anymore. I like the idea that Suki is just completely socially inept and has no idea how to talk to anyone but her mother, so her only way of flirting with a guy is to do the one thing she does best, which is fight. That makes for an interesting character, and see how effortlessly that feeling got across through character action and acting alone? Great job, show. More of this, please. Did you know she was an orphan? lived on the streets until she was hired as a house girl for the richest family on the island. She was quiet and kind. Insanely true. I've read the first half of the first Kyoshi book too, Katara. Did you get to the part where they can run on air yet? Oh, hey, it's Chin the Conqueror. Anyone else clock that? Big stupid hat and everything. Hey, Kyoshi, when I paint this mural, do you want me to paint it just exactly how it actually went or with you crushing Chin with all four elements at once? Personally, I don't really see the difference. Only justice will bring peace. Only justice will bring peace. And then Katara reads the wisdom that Kyoshi imparts to Aang at the end of the show, which is once again, one of those lines that doesn't really accomplish anything. 
it's just sort of there to be an Easter egg. I get wanting to have Easter eggs in here for your hardcore viewers, but they need to be more natural or you're just wasting time and script. I never wanted to fight. And I'm afraid of hurting someone. Okay, good to know, Ang. Thank you for filling me in on that. This is another one of those pretty egregious scenes where Ang just goes on at length about what he's thinking and how he's feeling. And I really do try to avoid the show don't tell thing. I have said it, but I don't really like it. At least saying it as simply as that. Because I feel like that can be used as sort of a vague statement that is just supposed to be true and all-encompassing. And people just say that and their criticism is done. It's the same reason I think calling someone cringe in an argument should be banned. It's too powerful. It just cuts the legs off the problem and doesn't really get at what matters. Ang just stands Standing around and monologuing his really rather complex emotions really seems like a symptom of a grander pacing issue. We don't have time for Ang to tackle these emotions naturally, or for him to get into situations he could find himself reckoning with them, because we need to stick to the script that's going at the speed of light so we can fit all this recognizable shit in. But the script still wants him to feel this way, so I suppose the best way to do it is to have Ang stare forward and say exactly how he feels again. It really does feel like the script had these beats and scenes written into them that absolutely had to be done, and then the rest of the show was written around them, so we have moments like this where they're like, just quick, say everything, go, 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 go. Aang, you're not alone. According to this, all the previous avatars are incarnations of your past life. You want someone to teach you, you just need to figure out how to connect to them. You won't believe it, but this isn't even Zuko's notebook. This is yet another book they found in the Kyoshi library that tells them exactly how to advance the plot, which actually, I know I came into this point with some venom in my voice, but it is probably better than it being Zuko's book. At least that makes it so they're here for a reason. But I still think it's kind of stupid and makes the world feel small if they could just read everything they need to learn somewhere. What is it? I like this scene. Like, sure, it's a little cheesy, but at least it feels like someone had a vision for it. It's not just painful dialogue where both characters explain what they're thinking, and you can start to get a feel that they're really starting to vibe with each other just through action. I don't think it's nearly as good of a moment as Sokka overcoming a character flaw in tandem with it. Sokka being awkward and then getting to flirt with a girl he's into seems fundamentally less interesting to me than Sokka's horizons being expanded as he realizes women can be warriors too, and him having to realize that his views are stupid, but this is still probably the best character work we've gotten so far, and maybe on Honestly, in the whole show. The world needs you. Oh this reads as a very strange moment to me. Aang is struggling internally with all of these thoughts, and then he's able to shut them out to commune with Kyoshi. But he continues to struggle with these thoughts for the rest of the season, so him being able to shut them out so relatively easily here in episode 2, I think doesn't read very well. Everything that can be done is being done. You've waited three years. You can wait a little longer. Iroh, you better watch it with that sass. Suko about to smack the rest of that mustache off your lip. There were times I thought I'd never find the Avatar, but it's almost worse now that I know he's close. I feel like Zuko's version of explaining his emotions might be a little better than Aang's. It might be hard to get this exact sentiment across otherwise, and it is an interesting situation to be in. I think I can give this one mostly a pass. Sometimes hope can be a cruel thing. Hope can be a cruel thing though. What the hell are you talking about? It would be like if Iroh turned to Zuko when he said that there was no hope at all and he just said, yeah, it's tough out here, man. Uh -huh. You need to turn your opponent's power against them. You know, I thought about giving this line a hard time because that's just not applicable without further instruction. It's just nothing, but that's also exactly what Suki says in the cartoon with no further explanation. And I've not liked that line of the cartoon for the same reason. The cartoon wasn't perfect either. That shit came off good. I don't know. I've never worn makeup before, but I thought it was more of a process than that. If I saw the shadow coming up on me in any context, I'd have to be like, all right, square up. There's a fucking demon outside. The truth is I envy you. I've always wondered what the world outside was like. I've always wondered what I'd find. Oh, I know. I know, I know that. I can gather that having watched the show and your conversations with your mother and how you act around Sokka. I feel like the Sokka Suki stuff is very close to being executed just straight up well. But then dialogue like this still seems to sneak in. I know, man, I'm watching it and the characters just have a good vibe. Just let the show be a show and not feel like an essay. The bell. You hear it too. Well, that's kind of a cute line though, I'll give it to you. No, you had it earlier! I'm mostly just being a dick about the theme one. I do wish they did the iconic one first, but them changing it slightly to hold on the third note really doesn't bother me all that much. I'm gonna shut up about it from now on. Require unparalleled strength. That's why I need to master all the bending disciplines? To become strong? 
Aang. I mean, yeah, that's probably part of it, right? Everyone's on the same page here. That is at the very least part of it. This scene is such a frustrating comparison to the original. Kyoshi is tasked with completely explaining the Avatar state, which when put up against the really very interesting visuals and powerful dialogue of the cartoon, it really highlights the lack of scope this show feels like it has. Kyoshi just explains this high concept shit to Aang while standing awkwardly close to him in a purple forest. It feels like this would be no one's idea of how to do this scene, you know what I mean? Do you guys think in the screenplay it read, Kyoshi and Aang stand 12 inches away from each other in a purple forest, and Kyoshi reads a laundry list of concepts at Aang, and then uses her psychic powers to put the plot in motion? No, I doubt it very much. This scene screams lack of budget at me, which isn't any of the actors' faults, they're just the ones saddled with dealing with it. And so, where there is one avatar, there may be another. I hate to say it, but it still looks like there's only one path up there where Zhao's men are, unless you're gonna climb these cliffs. Such a lovely island. And we welcome you to it, Commander. Though we wish we'd had some advance notice, we are quite unprepared for guests. Hey, some cool dialogue, some tension, some not putting it all out there, some trusting the audience. This little back and forth between Yukari, her name is Yukari by the way, and Zhao, of course Zhao's involved, is the best dialogue in the show so far. And it's immediately undercut by Yukari having superhuman strength. You see what I mean? What is the level of realism this show is trying to get at? She ragdolls this grown man with one hand, but then nothing like that is ever done again. It just confuses the audience, and what confuses me more is that up until right now, Suki's mom has been against Aang and his friends being there completely. For this exact reason, but now, as soon as the Fire Nation comes to town, she has flipped her views entirely for what seems like no reason. Maybe because she sees Suki like Sokka? The mayor of this island was against housing the Avatar for exactly this reason, has seemed annoyed with their presence at every turn, and when she is proven correct in being mad that the Avatar is here, what do you think she would do to keep her town and people safe? That's right, you got it, throw a guy using super strength and potentially get her entire village burned down. In the cartoon, Aang was an honored guest, and there wasn't really any discourse about him not being welcome. Oyaji mentions briefly that the island has stayed out of the war so far, but that goes unmentioned after they know for sure Aang is the Avatar. They're like, oh hell yeah! And then everyone's big chillin', great vibes, so them fighting for him at the end feels like it makes sense. But here, Yukari has been pissed off the gang has been here at every turn. Why is she endangering herself, her daughter, and her people for them? What if I hurt someone along the way? And how many? have already been hurt because you haven't been here. He didn't even run. Shut up. It's a big difference. He was just going to think and then fucking Poseidon said, ah, ah, ah. He did not run away. And you, Kiyoshi, I assume, since you are him, have knowledge of that. So why are you giving my man the gears? I'll save the psychic vision talk for another video too, even though I've already gone on about why I don't like it in my overview. <laughs> Yeah, Zhao and monkey sounds. There's good stuff in the show, see? You said he could help us. Where is the avatar? Zhao's like, I know, right? I'm getting through one way or another. What happens to you is your choice. It's weird that they gave Zuko this moment here. It's kind of like the moment in the cartoon where he spares the village after Aang gives himself up, but this time it's just for Katara, which makes the gesture seem a lot smaller, especially after he said this about the village in the previous episode. Burn the whole place to the ground. It's stuff like this that bothers me, these moments that seem to get shuffled around seemingly arbitrarily. It makes it feel like the showrunners don't understand why the original was written the way it was, or why the characters were characterized the way they were early on. Man, can we talk about how this show adores showing us Kaya getting horribly killed as well. I'm not sure how many times they show it, but it's probably more than you remember. I will show you what that power can do. Did Aang just go into the Avatar state in the spirit world? Double Avatar state? No one's going to stand in my way. See what I mean? They gave Zuko this moment of giving Katara a chance to stand down, but now he's literally about to burn slash kill her here. Something he didn't even do in an Agni Kai in the original. So is Zuko supposed to be characterized as this driven but overall reasonable character that happens to have goals that oppose the main cast? Or is he someone that murders someone who is defenseless? Why give Zuko this moment if you're immediately going to backtrack and make him seem like a pure villain 60 seconds later? Guess we don't get to find out because Kyoshi shows up. This is a super nitpick, feel free to disregard this entirely, but does anyone else not like that you can see the iris of the eye when they're in the Avatar state? Does it make it seem less powerful somehow, in some completely indescribable way, or is it just me? Maybe the pure white glow makes it seem like there isn't really any personality attached to the motions, it's just power and decision embodied, but when you can see their irises, they feel more like they're there, like they're present. Maybe it would be a nice touch if only Kiyoshi, who has control of the Avatar state, had her irises visible to show that control? Nah, I don't know. Okay, yeah, then there's this shit where Kiyoshi Looney Tunes flies away. Yes, the Avatar 
Carr can do that in the original, and yes, this is a new take on the show, like I said, but once again, I feel like this is a failure in communication to the audience. Kyoshi can do it because she's the Avatar, sure, fair enough, but we've already seen Firebenders fly with Sozin in the first episode, and since the fact that the comet is boosting in them in that scene goes nearly unmentioned, I feel like this scene could go even further in confusing a viewer, like, oh yeah, the flying thing, why aren't the Firebenders doing that more? You know what I mean? They really went with the sphere of elements visual this early, eh? My guess is that the plan is this will be a moment to parallel Kyoshi when Aang does this versus Ozai. You'll be like, oh, he's really mastered it because you can think back to Kyoshi doing it. And I think that's enough of an alright idea, but I've whined about this in the comics as well, and will whine about this in the future in Korra. Aang's force of nature sphere is so iconic in that final battle, I feel like it should just be left to him. Other than that though, cool music, I like how it sounds scary, the cartoon usually went in that direction for the Avatar State too. I think this little showcase is pretty cool on a visual level. Do I mind that Kyoshi still gets a crazy spotlight for some reason? Yeah, enough to complain about it, but only when we get to Roku later. And you've given us something far more valuable in return. A reason to believe again. Okay, this makes sense, seeing Kyoshi was probably akin to like a religious experience for you, but good thing you had that complete 180 in thinking out of nowhere to facilitate it happening. Sokka and Suki overall, I think, a success. Oh, notice the little fan designs on the shoulders of the armor here? Nice touch. Good job, costume designers. Oh, okay, bye, I guess. <laughs> she just fucking leaves. Kyoshi said I can only call upon one of the past avatars when I'm in their shrines. I don't know when she said that, my man, but if you say so, surely that rule will be stuck too closely since we've only got to keep it straight for six more episodes right? The waterbending masters there are the best in the world. They could train you. And you, right? You're motivated as well? Stoked, maybe? Working together, we'd be able to devote twice as many resources to the hunt. Now this is a change I can get behind. I was jazzed when I first heard this. Zuko and Zhao working together seems like a super interesting plot choice. I don't want everything to be exactly the same as the cartoon, I just want quality. And interesting changes like this is exactly what I was looking for when I came into the show. It streamlines the hunt for Aang, which seems important for our lower episode count, and also opens up the possibility for a lot more interpersonal conflict between Zuko and Zhao. Sounds good to me, man. The Avatar has returned. General Fong? We have to find a way. On a for real note though, Ozai is another point we'll get into later, when he has more screen time. And that's episode 2, and I still hold the same opinion as I did on my first watch through. I think episode 2 is much better than episode 1. There's some stuff in here that I can say was actually executed well. Of course, there are other parts that I think were rocky, the show never has a perfect episode. But really, I think it feels like it's found its footing more with character, and the tone is a bit more steady throughout. The Kyoshi scene as a pure turn your brain off eye candy thing is pretty cool, and I can appreciate that. Other than that, Sokka and Suki the highlight of this episode, it's just a pretty paint-by-numbers little flirty love story, some awkwardness, some longing stares, but I think it's done pretty well. Ang and Katara's side of the story is really, really boring though. If you look at their scenes alone, all they do is sit around and talk about how Ang is feeling or the plot. They don't get to do anything at all. The Zuko and Iroh stuff is all mostly serviceable, they're not a big part of the episode, but when we do get to see them, I feel like their scenes don't ever drag. And of course, Zhao, my man. The Kyoshi talk is a mess, it feels very stilted, and Yukari's motivation seems to flip-flop out of nowhere, and that's pretty much where it sits. I do think it's a big upgrade from episode 1, but that doesn't necessarily mean I think this is amazing television. At least I have some positive things to say about this one. Patreon shoutouts, if you want to see two brand new videos from me, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest single shoutout of all, once again, goes to my don't tier patron. Fuck's sakes. Dumdumstin, Langston, Osterishishin, Slastrassin, Bersitzernam, and Geklakit, Inder, Donobdamp, Schiffarts, Gazelle, Chefs, Capitan, who has made their name even longer, I assume to spite me, but this is a ludicrous amount of money to give anyone on Patreon, so I gotta respect it. How'd I do? Am I close? I can't be that far off. And it turns out it's not a single shoutout, because we have a new person in the don't tier. I guess you're getting a little peek behind the curtain as I record a new line for the don't tier, as I already had the other one recorded, because I record the shoutouts way earlier than the rest of the script. I guess that's your reward, Avatar Bogey. Not bad, huh? It's like a behind-the-scenes pass you've earned for everyone. Once again, I have nothing that is worth this amount of money, but you get to have all these words you put as your name in pretty rainbow colors, so that's probably worth it. Other massive shoutouts go to my other top patrons, A. Verner, who has the power to collapse themselves into a singularity whenever they want and form a black hole, so try not to be the straw that breaks the camel's back on a bad day here. Cynthia, the really cool dancer, who went to the gym and bench pressed all the weight in there at once, meaning like, yes, the plates, but also all the machines and the other people present as well. Der 50 Kobold, who can summon serpents by playing their childhood harmonica. Ian Byrne, who can't tie a knot in a cherry stem with his tongue, but I did see him knit a lovely scarf using only his mouth once. Josue Ramirez, who saved a former president's cat from 
from a tree and did a sweet backflip dismount. So now they have one free ICBM they can use however they see fit. Justin Strong, who found a language that everyone can understand even without learning it. Unfortunately, it's all rolled R's and clicking sounds, so it's really hard to speak. Lafert 13, who crashed a house party once by crashing a house he put on wheels into the party. Luna and Victor, who can only move when you're not looking at them, but man, are they fast. Potato Scream, who met with Mother Scorpion and learned the secrets of making a horrible poison come out of your tail. Now just to get a tail. Roxcoats, who performed CPR successfully on a blue whale by elbow dropping its heart over and over from the top turnbuckle. Also, happy birthday. The former meaning of life, who beat Deep Blue in chess 50 times in a row and now is starting to spell threats to humanity in chess notation. The 1 a.m. party, whose hands actually get fully dry from those hand dryers in public bathrooms. Thomas Lautenbach, who found water on Mars, but it's Dasani, so no one cares. And Whitrow, who has recently figured out how to reverse gravity by headbutting an apple up into a tree. And my other fuck you money patrons, Aurora, Balmier Candle, Catch Adorable, Gene Cree, Lurfax One, MC Ren, Omega Fighter, Sean Martin, Tater of Tots, That Blind Ginger, and Tiago Nascimento. And my god over analyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, Ang, Alan Garvin, Andrew Watchard, Angel Molina, Black Smeam, Bob Def, Chandler Crump, Charles the Fartbender, Kobe Smith, Connor Gallery, Dead Rat Fiasco, Deathly Healer, Dizzy Payne, Dr. Xerox, Dominic Saint, Donut, Emma Not Emma, Aaron Grace, Flamio Hoffman, Gianluca Leandro Magi, I'm a Match, Jackson, Jeremy Rubenstein, John Ajaka, Justin Scott, Kelly, Mac, Mac Yanalicio, Medium D Speaks, Michael Fallon, Mighty Virus, Nick, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Reese, Rocket Mist, Ryan Gregorikos, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatt, Sergeant Carrot 69, Shane Antonacci, Sean Flowers, Spicy Ketchup, Super Snipper, The Long and Short of It, Thomas Dredgen, Thomas Graff, Victoria the Queen, Von Kantspell, and some sort of bear face. Next up, Omashu, and the Northern Airtown Bowl, and Jack.